As some of you may already know, I've been working on my third book for, I don't know, about around about a year and a half now, putting together ideas, starting in on the essays and the outlines. Uh, and it had felt like most of it was there. Most of, most of the concepts uh, were there. For those of you who've read my previous two books, uh, you know sort of the structure of a, a series of essays that are all related to each other uh, and, and sort of take you through a narrative of, of forming a particular argument. Uh, some things have happened in the last few days, really about the last week, that have sort of been the linchpin, brought everything back together. Uh, on this particular project, and although I'm writing, I've, I felt a little bit of a sense of urgency to do a video. I wanted to do a video uh, on kind of the framework of this this kernel, because I think now I have really the kernel of, uh, of what's going on. There were some things that happened this week. They created connections. I made some notes, and I wanted to walk through these uh, because I think that people will find it enlightening. And so this notion is what I'm calling the consensus crisis. And I think that it's an underlying, and I think you'll agree by the end of this, that it's an underlying uh, sort of idea or energy or however you want to say it that's going on right now in the world and that is giving people a lot of grief. It's the cause for a lot of anxiety that people have. And I think that getting this framework, uh, you'll start to understand a whole bunch of different things. So there, there are a lot of concepts that are in here. Uh, conspiracy theories, the Mandela effect, that one just sort of came in and I realized, oh wow, that's, this is actually something. The censorship on social media, uh, the rise of identity politics, increase in tribalism and populism, uh, Bitcoin, uh, and and how that's potentially a, a lifeboat and kind of an awesome foundation. So uh, I wanted to do this because when we talk about all of those things that, that I just mentioned, uh, people have been commenting on them across sort of modern culture, across all kinds of languages. We see these ideas permeating all around the world, creating conflict, creating anxiety, so I wanted to do this because I've been working on this framework. I had a lot of it and understood the, an idea of what was going on. Now I'm able to articulate it much better. And the reason I want to do this is because really, the, you know, I see a lot of people seeing this as negative, and I think that the anxiety is a negative, but uh, people are wanting to sort of stop it or turn the clock back. And the thing is, it can't be stopped. Uh, the clock can't be turned back. This is a motion that's happening. But the thing is that it can be navigated with a lot less stress and anxiety. So this is, there's a shift taking place. And it's a shift that I've been writing about and talking about for years. So anybody who's been following me, who's read my stuff, my articles, um, watched my video series. I mean, there's my video series from years ago called The Ascendant Project, where I think it's like 18 hours long, really walking through my idea at that time and what I understood about the shift. It's really, it takes up the last quarter of my last book, Self-Ownership, uh, where I talk about this concept of the crypto savage and the new emerging culture. I had understood it a little bit better at that time, really delving deep into Bitcoin and building my business Cointext over the last year, really getting into the community, delving even further into the technology. That has also been very congruent for the things that I had been thinking about already and to better understand this shift because Bitcoin is a part of that shift. The culture wouldn't be picking up this very new and very esoteric technology and actually seeking to use it. We wouldn't see its growth if the world's, if the zeitgeist wasn't ready for it already. Okay, so here are the things that happened this week where the these connections that I'm talking about were made. Uh, I think maybe the first thing was this Joe Rogan, uh, Alex Jones coming back onto the Joe Rogan show and then being there with Eddie Bravo, going through these conspiracy theories as Alex Jones usually did. If you haven't watched it, watch it. So two interesting things. One, before it was even done, there were already YouTube videos up that was like criticism of it or people commenting on it, making videos. If you go, you'll see now, I mean, it's it's been what, a week, less than a week, and there are tons of clips, tons of people commenting. Uh, it had 
a, a million views by the, basically by the time that it stopped. I watched it relatively live. I sort of watched it on a bit of an hour delay. I was doing some other things and had to pause it from time to time. Uh, and there was like a million views at the end. At the end, before 24 hours was up, there was like 4 million views of this thing. So that's wild. Uh, and, and it's not like Joe had uh, announced it. It's not like there was some big fanfare beforehand. I fa found out about it because Pete Raymond just like sort of gave me a, a text and he was like, hey, oh, dude, this is crazy. Uh, right now I'm watching uh, Joe Rogan and, and Alex Jones. I had no idea that it was even about to take place. Um, so that was interesting. One of the interesting things about it was this, how they were sort of like putting up uh, the proof in real time. So like Alex would say something and then they would put up the the proof he'd say oh go and pull up the pig chimeras the pig human chimeras oh go pull this up go pull this up and there's a there's a theme in that this idea of of reaching into reality and reaching into truth and the way that we're able to do it a little bit differently now is a way that humans have never been able to do it to just have a discussion about what is going on and what is reality, what is a fact, and then let's Google it right now. Let's figure out what the year that this happened was. Was there an article about this? What was the actual quote of this person? All of that. We take it for granted, but that is brand new in the scope of human existence. And it's not like humans have not been trying to know what was a fact in the past. Of course, this is a normal part of, of just being a human. But up until now, that it has not been possible for us to do it at that speed in real time. So that's, don't, don't discount that. Um, also, what happened this week was uh, I have a video from 2017 that was given a warning label uh, basically censored by YouTube in a new form of censorship. And so I want to read you what YouTube sent to me regarding this. So here's the message. Your video, The Vin Armani Show, from May 29th, 2017, with Jack Spierko, was flagged to us by the YouTube community. Upon review, we have placed restrictions on how the video will be shown. Please note that your video will continue to be available on YouTube. And then the video content restrictions. We believe in free expression, even when that expression is unpopular or potentially offensive to some viewers. In some cases, flagged videos that do not clearly breach the community guidelines, but whose content is potentially controversial or offensive may remain up, but with some features disabled. This includes videos denying a well-documented violent event took place. Uh, your video will be shown after a warning message. In addition, certain features such as comments, sharing, thumbs up, and suggested videos have been disabled. Your video is also ineligible for monetization. So uh, this has actually, I put in a, uh, a, an appeal, and, and upon appeal, they reversed it. So I find, found that interesting. I, I have some, some real doubts about it being flagged by the YouTube community. Uh, what had happened in this video was in the beginning of this video, the first hour we looked at, which was common, a common thing for us to do on the show, the Manchester bombing had just happened. There were tons of inconsistencies in the reporting between the different uh, media outlets. And so we were pointing that out and saying, okay, the official narrative is even screwed up in and of itself. Like here are the inconsistencies. That was a huge part of the show, it was like an analysis of, a critical analysis of the, of the media. And so they actually, they reversed that. But what I'm thinking is like, who's really going and watching? I mean, it's not, it doesn't even, it honestly, that particular video, if you go and look at it, it's not even tagged with anything like Manchester bombing or anything like that. Somebody would have to have gone back to the Jack Spierko episode and been wanting to watch for Jack Spierko, I guess, and watch that first hour uh, all the way back two years ago. So I have a, a strong feeling that this was actually an algorithm, which is an important part of this whole thing. Um, so then Project Veritas, they uh, released a report on uh, active backend manipulation of content by Facebook. 
And it was, I think it was in watching that that some Mandela Effect videos started popping up, or, or, or I got into a bit of a YouTube rabbit hole when um, uh, yesterday afternoon and then into the evening. And I ended up watching this really interesting video where this, this guy was talking about the Mandela Effect and his basic premise was uh, that we all died in 2012. And it had a bunch of bunch of views, like way disproportionate to his other videos. And so I watched it, and what I found was interesting was that his basic notion was that something has occurred because uh, there's a consensus breakdown. And I thought, oh, that's so interesting that he's using this word consensus breakdown to describe the Mandela effect. So if you don't know the Mandela effect, this is where some people remember certain things as happening. I'll talk about that in a little while, and then others remember it a different way. Uh, but it's basically it's about that there is a lack of consensus between people as to certain cultural artifacts. What did a particular painting look like? What did someone say in a movie? What were when did someone die? Uh, these sorts of, of things that there is this lack of consensus and that people are starting to notice it and they're calling this the Mandela effect. So he's using this term saying that consensus is starting to break down. And I've been using this term uh, uh, I've been talking about consensus-based uh, reality or truth versus authority-based reality or truth. And I've been saying that really the shift that we're seeing worldwide is that authority-based truth has been the, the gold standard, let's say, for really 10, uh, maybe 10,000 years. Whereas now, and it's with the advent of social media, and it's with the... Uh, you know, everybody being interconnected in the way that, that they are, we're seeing this emergence of, cons emergence of consensus based gaining of reality. And so what do I mean by the difference between the two of them? I think that the, the two best examples are, see, we use both of these every day in terms of our structures of reality and the way that we organize ourselves within reality. We do it sometimes based on consensus for certain things, sometimes based on authority for other things. And I'll explain them both. But to start out with, you could take the, the difference between language and law. Language is consensus-based organization, whereas law is authority-based organization. You can kind of understand the law and authority. We get that. But then it's like, what am I talking about when I talk about consensus based being language? It's the idea that you're listening to me speak. I'm using words. We don't really know where the, why is the word word? Why does that mean a mouth noise? Uh, we can go back and we can go into sort of, um, you know, the etymology of various different words, and we can see, oh, it, it arrived from this place, but why was it even called that in the first place? And then how did it change? We sort of understand that it did change, and we have an idea that language changes and language grows and evolves, but it's hard to pinpoint any particular person or authority who said, oh yeah, that little furry animal that, that lives in your house, that thing is called a cat. And it's only, and why is that the reality that the mouth noise that is cat is the one that it should be? It's, there's, for every language, there's a word for that, and it's not cat in every language. So language, uh, more, more importantly, we'll call it lexicon, which really means a dictionary, and, and we'll use that, that the lexicon, the dictionary that you have, has sort of evolved in an organic way through consensus, okay? So when we think of authority-based structures, they're hierarchies. That's an authority-based structure, and there's a top. So you think about, you go and you, you type in a hierarchy diagram, and what you're gonna wind up with, just type that into Google, go to images, invariably you're gonna see a whole bunch of pyramids basically. And so that's what the symbol of the pyramid is a representation of. It's a representation of a hierarchy. And whereas consensus-based structures are networks, go type in network diagram. Instead, what you're going to see is something that looks way more organic with these sort of, these, these centers that then pop out into these, ends up looking much more sort of circular and organic, much more chaotic 
as well, less ordered, much more chaotic, much more organic. And so this is also, we could see consensus-based truth is an organic, uh, truth is a chaotic truth, and authority-based truth or reality is an ordered, uh, an ordered truth. So what's interesting, hierarchies have a top, right? The top of the pyramid, that's, that's the buck stops here, right? That's the ultimate authority. So in a, a church structure, that would be something like God. In a, uh, a corporate structure, that might be something like the president and CEO. Uh, in a governmental structure, that would be something like the, or a military structure, that would be something like the commander in chief. Just the chief in general is going to be that individual at the top of the hierarchy. And then down from there is like they're the general, the lieutenants, right? The sergeants, the privates. And there's more privates than there are sergeants, and there's more sergeants than there are lieutenants, and there's more lieutenants than there are generals. And that's how you get that, that hierarchical structure. So the, with consensus-based structures, when you're talking about a network, networks don't have a top because, see, they're flat like this. They have centers. And from out of those, they have hubs. From out of those centers, you have the different nodes. So they have nodes and nodes are connected to different nodes, and the nodes that have the highest number of connections, when you draw out the topology, look like they're at the center. Everything's connecting to them. So you could go and type in network diagram, and you'll see, you'll come up with that, that sort of stuff. So why, why in, this is my own thought of why these two forms would have developed, what is the good use for them, and why we've been in an authority-based paradigm for, let's say, the last 10,000 years is because authority-based structure is really, really suited for fast communication of truth, of reality, or of commands, um, which is great for when it needs to be quick across a lot of people that need to specialize but also move as one group, move as one entity in an ordered way. So hunting, war, right? A better organized army with the chain. Why do armies have a chain of command? Because it works. If you receive an order from someone who is of a higher rank than you, you don't question it. That's authority-based reality. You've received an order from an authority you don't question it, you just move. And think about the speed with which you can communicate with even hundreds of thousands of people if you're a general to get this group, I want that group to go left. And it's like, communicate that to the lieutenant. He communicates that to his few sergeants. They communicate that to all of them. And all of a sudden, boom, they all move left. Right? Then move right, boom. Now, you couldn't communicate to each and every person because you have a lack of uh, communication technology at, in the beginning as these structures come up. And this is what I believe is changing, right? So a consensus-based structure to get to reality, it takes way more iterations to figure out, well, what is that thing called? It's way more iterations back and forth. Think about how we learn language. We hear it from many, many different people. We have to hear it over and over from many different people until we come to a realization that, oh, that's a cat. They keep saying cat. They keep saying cat. Even what's my name? Oh, he calls me uh, Vin. She calls me Vin. She calls me Vin. She calls me Vin. Ah, I'm Vin. I'm Vin. Right? So this is, uh, this is the many-to-many idea. And this is why, this is where things like Bitcoin come in. This is where studying these protocols becomes very interesting because like Bitcoin is a gossip protocol. It's many to many communication and it's sort of trying to find truth by polling as many people as it can. And then you get this idea of, yeah, this is, this looks like this is where everybody's going. I'm going to go along with that as well. That's consensus based. What's interesting, the gossip protocol is also referred to as the epidemic protocol because the same way that gossip moves, which is a meme, a memetic, memetic movement, you could say even a memetic virus, is the same way that genetic organic viruses move. 
same way. You map them in the same epidemic. It's the same epidemiology of when you watch the spread of a virus is the same way that you would look at, say, the spread of a transaction into the mempools around, uh, around a Bitcoin network. So a gossip protocol and epidemic protocol are the same, and that's important for this idea. So when with our uh, consensus-based organizational structures, which is like language, which is culture, in the past, for most of human existence, those changed very slowly, very slowly. Think about how slowly it must have been for Latin to change into Spanish right now, while at the same time it was changing into Portuguese, while at the same time it was changing into Italian, it was changing into Romanian, which are now, for the most part, I mean, you, you, you might, if you're a native Spanish speaker, be able to get a gist of what an Italian is saying. Certainly, uh, Portuguese speakers can understand Spanish speakers. What's weird is that it doesn't always go in reverse. So, because there's enough familiar, but it's different enough that, that we would recognize, oh yeah, those are definitely different languages. They're not, an Italian speaker would hear Spanish and say, oh, that, that person's speaking a different language from me and vice versa. These things changed slowly. So, and that's, language is just one sort of artifact of culture. So cultures change slowly in that way too, because the Latin culture, since it's the basis of the language, was clearly a basis of the French uh, culture, the uh, you know, the Spanish culture, Italian culture, Romanian culture, so many, so many. And, you know, we often trace language and to see uh, where's the root of that word, what's the etymology, and that'll often tell us the, what the cultures were that were influencing at a particular time when this word came into use. So that's the cultural lexicon. Laws, authority-based structures, can change fast. Think about like marijuana laws recently to where today I've got a joint in my pocket and it's illegal. And literally tomorrow when the law flips over, all of a sudden, totally legal. Or that I could uh, be standing here on this side of uh, one state line, let's say Nevada, and I've got a joint in my pocket, legal. I take a step over this line and I'm in Arizona, I can be arrested for it. This is an authority-based structure where you're basically looking to an authority, which is the law, and we see the enforcement of the law in a hierarchical structure, right? The police are in a hierarchy. The law enforcement, law enforcement in general is, is hierarchical. It's always in a hierarchy. You have a direct supervisor that you report to, and they have a supervisor, and they have a supervisor until it gets to the top. So this was true... This was the model, how it had been. We had culture that was evolving slowly, and we had authority or laws that could change on a dime. Uh, a new government comes in and takes over your old government, and the laws can change tomorrow. Uh, you get newly elected leaders, and the law changes tomorrow. You have a king die, and uh, his son or daughter takes over. Uh, the laws can change in an instant by fiat. But culture didn't. Culture, culture moved slowly, slowly, slowly. Now, for most of human existence, that's how it was. Except that started to change. Started to change. And I think it's the, we could see this with the, so look, if we were to go back, let's say 500 years, the cultural, the change in the cultural lexicon, so the change in the, 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 the foundational vocabulary of a culture changed so little over time that your life was probably very, very close, perhaps indistinguishable from your grandparents' life. The technology hadn't changed. The, the diet hadn't changed. The day-to-day -day activities within your village hadn't changed. Things just went on for generations and generations, changing so slow that, that life really felt eternal, really felt eternal. Uh, and th but then, 
Like in the last century, we get the introduction of, of popular media, radio in particular. And you'll notice that that's at the time that this whole thing speeds up. That the cultural lexicon is able to change because the communications medium makes consensus change and alter faster. It is able to introduce and spread mimetic viruses that will alter the, the cultural lexicon, the DNA of the, the, the memome, if you will, like the genome of certain individuals and make certain individuals have consensus and fall out of consensus, not yet with their peers, but certainly with those in previous generations. So it's like after the introduction of radio is when you start to get these distinct generations, right? Where the cultural, cultural lexicon, it's, it, it changes in these like 20 year spans. And what you have is parents begin to not actually be of the same culture as their children. And so this is, this is really what the baby boom is about. And I think that it's because of the change in communications technology after World War II. World War II, it ended, and, and during the war, communications technology the, was heavily invested in, obviously for military reasons, and then that was repurposed for civilian reasons and and then it was it was grown out and you had the the rise of a uh, you know television and certainly uh, movies a lot more radio became ubiquitous all of that stuff it's happening after the war and so you get this change in the memeome of the baby boomers and that's why they're that's why they're different and that was the beginning of the consensus breakdown and the beginning of the crisis and i think that it's one of the reasons why this whole like boomer meme is so prevalent why why they're such a unique group they were the first group that had the idea that their children were going to have a different culture than they did because that was the case and but that was mind-boggling to their parents who had, who were still part of that sort of very very slow change in the cultural lexicon what's happened now and this is what I believe is the consensus crisis, is that the communications technology has been improved to such a degree, the bandwidth is so much higher, therefore the, the, the pipe, the vectors for the mimetic viruses to move and to basically throw people out of consensus, you can fall out of consensus with your closest peers on fundamental issues within months. And anybody who's on social media, particularly Facebook, knows that this can happen. People that you went to school with for a decade or more, right? Maybe you went to school all the way through with them. You would think that all of that would have programmed you to basically be of the same culture, but you can look and see that you're not. And it's even, it's happening even faster. And I think that this is where this whole conspiracy theories thing comes in. And I think that this is why certain sectors of society that are interested in continuing the status quo to their advantage find this to be a crisis. So conspiracy theories, what are they? What they really are is they are their mimetic viruses that are breaking consensus. Because if other people start to pick that up as the new consensus, it literally will create a new culture. It'll create a brand new culture. And that's a problem because cultures clash. A conspiracy theory now, just like with my video where they said, well, you didn't break the community guidelines, but you were questioning you were saying that an event that was heavily covered by the media, the official narrative, you're saying that it wasn't that official narrative. That's what it is. Questioning the official narrative is a virus. It's an attempt to break consensus. You're trying to change the memo. Now think about all the places where consensus is specifically used. The word consensus is specifically used when talking about conspiracy theories, climate change. There's a scientific consensus that human beings are responsible for climate change. And anybody who says otherwise is breaking consensus. Vaccinations and the anti-vax thing. There's a scientific uh, consensus that vaccines are safe and effective. And anyone who's breaking that 
is a real threat. Flat Earth. This is such a weird one because this popped out of nowhere. And it's like, wow, I thought we really had that, that handled. And it just goes to show that it almost doesn't matter how much evidence there is because it's all been flattened. It's all been flattened. There's very few videos set out to prove what there had already been consensus about for a long time, and that is that the Earth is a ball that rotates around the sun. You go to YouTube, you go you know, onto your phone, there's very little of that, but there's a whole lot. So this is sort of like a, what would be called a Sybil attack. There's a whole lot of videos, very well produced, you know, very passionately arguing for the idea of the flat earth. And then you've got the algorithms, the YouTube algorithms that if you start watching flat earth videos, it's just going to show you more flat earth videos. And your brain starts to believe that, oh, that's actually the consensus. And then you follow along. So this is important. What else are the things? Russian election interference. Oh, there's a consensus among the intelligence agencies that the Russians interfered with the election. Of course, 9-11 and other attacks right? The official narrative, the consensus that this is what happened. Scientists have, have looked at that. Political people, we've investigated, we've done all of this. So when there are these breaking consensus, when conspiracy theories get to a certain level, like before in the early days of Alex Jones, say, he wasn't really a threat because that was fringe. But with the capabilities, this many-to-many -many gossip network, they're like, oh no, this is spreading and they can watch it spread. The people who are running these platforms can watch it spread because they've been doing the metrics on these things because they've been selling ads. So they can watch an idea spread. They can watch it grow. They can watch because people are not just consuming it. They're also creating their own videos. As soon as you create your own video, your own podcast, your own content, you are now a, you're a carrier of this mimetic virus. And when people start to agree, basically what happens is the culture starts to fork. And every time that you accept one thing, so for instance, if you accept flat earth and that becomes your new consensus, think about all of the things. It was, this was evident on the, the Alex Jones, uh, uh, Joe Rogan show, because Eddie Bravo was on there too. And it's like, well, if you accept that uh, flat earth, you would saw this with him. You have to accept that space isn't real either. And then if space isn't real, well, we don't have satellites. And then if satellites aren't real, well, what is GPS? And then it's like, well, then maybe there's not gravity. Well, that's different. And it's just like your whole, you fall so far out of consensus. And this is what you see also with the Bitcoin fork that like in over time, you get further and further away from each other. Just like over time, Italian is more different than Spanish and it continues going. And so now we're fractionating super fast, super fast. And there are some reasons why, some economic reasons why Facebook, Twitter, and all of that would, would want to stop that fractionation if they could. And I'll, I'll talk about that. But so the Mandela effect is part of this. It's not that, uh, it's just people recognizing that we've fallen out of consensus. And then because they don't have the correct lexicon, they don't have a frame of reference, they don't have a framework for describing that, then you get into things like, oh, it's a, a hologram that's in a simulation theory that's being controlled by this or this or this. But that's just like an attempt to explain that they've noticed something that they hadn't noticed before. All right. So think about what are, when you see Mandela effect, one of the common things among them is that they are instances of these often repeated cultural artifacts. So what do I mean? It's like in Star Wars, uh, you know, Luke, I am your father, but really he says, no, I am your father. But people are like, no, I remember him saying, Luke, I am your father. Also, life is like a box of chocolates from Forrest Gump, the Mona Lisa, uh, having more of a smile or less of a smile, the thinker having his he really has his hand here, but people interpret that he had his hand here. Or uh, I saw a recent one that was interesting because they showed like Oscar awards and stuff and, or, or Golden Globes. And it was uh, people thinking that the show was called Sex in 
the city as opposed to, of course, sex and the city, which it actually was. The reason I remember this was because the first time that I read, I remember the first time reading it being like, oh, it's called sex and the city. And this was, you know, multiple decades ago. I remember I was young because my stepmother used to love to watch it. And I said, oh, I always thought it was called sex in the city, but it's because I had heard people say it. I hadn't read it. Same thing with Luke, I am your father. You've, I guarantee you that you've seen in other movies and other things, people making fun of it, and they would say, Luke, I am your father. They're not, they're carrying on a different consensus. So consensus has shifted a little bit. And so you have kind of like a pseudo memory, but really what you're, you're identifying is not a memory. You're identifying your consensus. Same thing with life is like a box of chocolates, but what he really says is mom always said life was like a box of chocolates. But think about all the times that you have seen that Forrest Gump scene, recreated, parodied, made fun of, and in every single one of those, they say life is like a box of chocolates. And so that becomes the consensus. Also, think about the Mona Lisa and the thinker. You've seen those recreated as copies in comic books and whatnot, replicas and all of that. And the smile is uh, accentuated or somebody puts the thinker's hand in the wrong place. And, and then that just becomes the, the consensus. And so what this is really all about and why it's freaking people out is that uh, we have always had these things. We're always out of consensus on various different things. Certain people will think of things in different ways, clearly, because otherwise the parody wouldn't have gotten it wrong. And then you follow along with the parody. And so that's really what it is, is that it's like, it's just like following the, the chain with the most proof of work is that you're following along the one that you've seen come back to you the most. What's happening now, though, is because we have this many-to-many -many communication, now we're starting to notice because we're able to communicate with a whole bunch of people, and some of these we're going to get. But these, are, these have always existed, and the prime example is tomato-tomato. You say tomato, I say tomato. At some point, that was the same word, and at some point, it diverged. But until somebody's talking to you and they say tomato, and then you say, what, what are you talking about, tomato? The word's tomato. It's always been tomato. There's your Mandela effect. There's your Mandela effect. There's an interesting quote from uh, a Bitcoin core developer, Peter Todd, that I quote a lot. I actually used it in a, a talk that I gave at pork fest where he says um talking about bitcoin he says the nature of this type of consensus protocol is that you'd rather all nodes come to the same conclusion even if that conclusion is wrong thus you want as much uniformity as possible multiple implementations are expensive and inevitably detract from that goal so we're looking to try to break that cognitive dissonance and that's why the mandela effect upsets us we want everybody to have a shared cultural lexicon because otherwise it creates cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance in mass creates a breakup of a culture. And what you have with cultures is there's only, there's only basically three ways, like three A's of dealing with culture clash. You have a, a change in association, which is like you just go somewhere else and only associate with people who share your consensus, who are speaking your language, who have your lexicon. So that's like a lot of people, the reason they come to New Hampshire and become free staters is they only want to associate with libertarians. Or it might be the same reason why somebody would go and, uh, you know, go to some fundamentalist Islamic country, why somebody might want to, uh, a Jewish person might want to move to Israel. So you've got association, You've got assimilation. That's where you decide that you're going to basically become a member of a different culture by adopting their lexicon. That could be learning their language, starting to eat their food, being educated with their history that they're going to teach you so that you can come into consensus with them. So that's you coming into consensus with them. And then there's annihilation. 
And we do see that. That's a, that's a danger. And I think it's something people worry about is that you have two cultures next to each other where the assimilation just can't happen. They go to war. They go to war. So trade creates, trade between cultures creates assimilation. That's what you see, economic activity. That's why that, that, that old saying, if goods don't cross borders, armies will. Uh, because if there's that friction, that culture clash, uh, we've already had, already association isn't working because that other culture's coming in and those viruses, those mimetic viruses are, tr are have the potential to break our consensus and it gives us anxiety because it gives us cognitive dissonance and we don't like that. Now, the thing about YouTube is that you can go down these rabbit holes because of algorithms. And so it's reinforcing once you get once you go down this this viral path, it will actually hit you with even more of the virus, more of the mimetic virus. Uh, and this is this is not like some external control or anything like that. This is just how human beings behave. So you could look at there's two experiments that are really really good, but one is this Princeton smoke filled room study from 1968, where basically they uh, put a test subject in a room. First, they did it with the person alone, and then they started filling the room with smoke. And then they did it with actors who were there who were going to behave like nothing was wrong. And so the study says when alone, three quarters of people reported the smoke before the experimental uh, period was terminated. The average time to report was two minutes of first noticing the smoke. So you'd be sitting there alone. You're like filling out a questionnaire. It's a psychology, you know, this is a psychology experiment. They're videotaping you with hidden cameras and whatnot. You think you're doing one thing. It's something else. And the smoke starts coming into the room. You, if you're alone within two minutes, people are getting up and reporting like, Hey, 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 I think there's smoke in the room. Then when two passive Confederates were present, two people that were working with the experimenters who were instructed just to act as if nothing was wrong, only 10% of the subjects in this study actually got out of the room or reported what was ostensibly a serious problem. Nine out of 10 of the subjects actually kept working on the questionnaire they were given, rubbed their eyes and waved smoke out of their faces. So they, this has been repeated many, many, many times and it's always the same. But we're talking about the difference between like two minutes and then somebody sitting in a smoke-filled room for 20 minutes just because the other people there, just because the consensus was there's nothing wrong. This is how powerful our drive to find reality from consensus in the absence of an authority is. So basically, we will look for authority for reality. We will look for consensus for reality. But in the vein of YouTube, there's no authority, which is what they're trying to implement. Warning labels, warning right? They're trying to become the authority. But this, this breaks the, the basic model. Like that gives people even more cognitive dissonance regarding it. The, so authority-based truth, there was a great, the prime scientific uh, experiment, psychological experiment on this is the Milgram experiment, experiment. You've seen this. This is where somebody is basically told by a person, an actor in a lab coat to keep asking questions. And if the person gets it wrong, they shock them with increasing amounts. And some people would even take that and they'd be like, are you sure the person on the other side is screaming? It's fake. Of course, it's an experiment. Are you sure I should shock him? And they'd be like, please proceed. Person in a lab coat, just watching. People would take it up to the lethal level where they would shock somebody to a lethal level to literally kill them just from getting their reality from authority. This is just how human beings are. And so we've had an authority-based system. And what you see is authorities breaking down. We no longer have the television networks as authorities. They're having to compete in the same environment of social media as everybody else. The best that they can do is to use the consensus mechanisms of a Sybil attack. Like, what's a Sybil attack? You just spin up a whole bunch of identities and have them all do something. These are like sock puppet accounts, Russian bots. All of this is a manipulation of the fact that we're getting our reality from the consensus in real time, the cultural consensus. And so that's what it's about. It's about the censorship is really just an attempt by this old authoritative structure to try to control these mimetic outbreaks. Uh, it's quarantine. 
being launched by the hierarchy uh, that's in control of the environment, which is the, which are the social media platforms. And you should expect this because that hierarchy comes out of both academia, which is a hierarchy, and and it's a and the corporate structure, which is a hierarchy. And the important part about it is it's purely economic. If you think about th this, is they're not probably it's the system responding itself. You know, you get enough people together. This is Gustave Le Bon talks about the crowd. You get an organization together and the organization starts to do things. Yes, human beings act, there's human action, but we do act within a, uh, within a context of a group. And so the group will start to do things. And that's what's happening. And one of the reasons why is that, think about it, if you've got advertisers, you know, what makes these platforms move? It's when the advertisers say, I don't want to advertise on that. We can't advertise on that. So that's a corporate authority structure making a call. We don't like that. We don't want to advertise on that. And so what are they trying to do? They're trying to front run. They're trying to get out ahead and predict, oh, which of these viruses are advertiser friendly and will make us money? And which of these viruses will advertisers pull from over time? Let's get out ahead of it. And so in just... In closing, I, I do think that that's what this is. We're in a consensus crisis. We don't know how to, we don't have a foundation. We don't know how to find reality. We don't know where to start in this new consensus-based decentralized paradigm. This is only going to get more and more. We are only, we have a crisis of truth because we have a crisis of consensus. And the authority structure is no longer uh, it's no longer viable. People are are rejecting it just because there is there is uh, consensus is much more powerful. You know, your culture is more powerful than your government. Consensus is just it's it it sticks deeper in you. Our desire to follow the herd is much stronger than our desire to follow authority. And we know this. We know this. Um, authority has to become increasingly brutal, uh, and eventually there's just not the resources to overcome culture. Culture always wins. It's a leading indicator of politics. It always wins. And so what we have now is we have a fragmentation, and that's why you see so many people talking about, you know, uh, lamenting the, the loss of Western culture. Yeah, that's real. Like the culture is busting apart because it's so easy for consensus to break over time. But it's one reason why I think people are going to increasingly gravitate toward Bitcoin once they realize that uh, of, of the structures that I've seen out there, it is one that is at least presenting an idea of a foundation, and that is proof of work. Like, okay, what is some objective truth that we can all agree upon? And it's not necessary that... Um, that it be anything special. Uh, it just has to be some axiom and some idea. And that's why I think proof of work is that to where there's, there's the math involved to where we can, with this sort of objective mathematics, the postmodernists would say even that's not necessarily objective, uh, which is it's true to some degree, but we got to have something to start with. And I think that it creates something that even those with disparate cultures can begin to agree upon and where economic activity can take place. And that, that may be what ends up being that hub around which that protocol, you need to have a protocol around which the greater network can all connect. And so I think that that's, I think that it's, it's a place to start. And it is certainly something that I'm going to be writing about and talking about more, this idea is something that I'm going to explore in my next.